All right, hello. Uh, we are going to be doing two things today, basically. We're going to do our June report, which we usually will do with a written report that you get. We're going to do it today as this presentation. We will be combining it. So this is Dr. Juan Lopez. We're gonna be uh, doing a couple of things today. We're gonna be doing the June report, as well as an update on the OSHA protocols for COVID-19. First, we'll talk about some of the numbers as we always review. We had a, a fantastic month in June. As you can see, we are uh, in a good rebound from what was a little bit of a down May and we're right in line where we should be uh, performing every month. Quick couple of things in terms of general points. It's good to see that demand is still high for dental services. Shortage of dental personnel though is causing many offices to stop taking new patients. And it's universally known that not being able to accept new patients affects levels of production. It also makes it more difficult to compensate for normal uh, patient loss or attrition. The reduction also to two full-time hygienists will cause a backflow of patient appointments, potentially causing some patient loss and reduction in productivity. We also have to, moving forward, as I've stressed before, keep an eye on inflation, but now we can uh, compound uh, the concerns with uh, increasing gas prices. And in terms of the inflation, uh, I think there are starting to be some concerns uh, from the government agencies as this is not doesn't seem to be slowing down. So not accepting new patients is one topic I wanted to discuss because uh, it, I, I want to illustrate how this could affect us long term. The short term, we not might see it, but long term, as the months keep dragging on in 2021, we may start seeing some of these effects. And I'm going to give you a real uh, life example. A patient was accepted into the practice due to a fractured tooth on 925-20, which is a Friday, actually. It was a Friday emergency from what was uh, apparently a good experience of course he decided to continue on to do the following treatment he actually scheduled a complete new patient exam he where he had eye hygiene and x-rays of course we ended up doing crown on number 29 which was the two that originally brought him to the office through that exam uh, we found other areas of concern which were cavities on the following teeth that you see there so there was a, a couple of a, quite a bit of work that was done multiple surfaces um, then from what seems to be a, you know, a, a growing relationship that's going well, he has an upcoming wedding and he wanting to have a new smile, he inquired about how he could improve. Uh, and after analysis and some time I spent with the presentation that we did, we ended up doing three, a four interior crown, seven, eight, nine, and 10, purely aesthetics. Uh, it will inc improve his function actually because he has a bit of an open bite. And he even mentioned that he has difficulty eating sandwiches and burgers and things of that nature. Uh, but you know, this illustrates not only this is a win-win situation because somebody else, somebody joined her practice, improved their oral health care, uh, has has made tremendous uh, uh, progress in in how his overall oral health has been. Plus, we've done some work, and uh, you know, as, if everything keeps going the way he is, he may be a patient in our practice for a very long time. But this looks straight the issue of when you're not taking new patients, you know, uh, eventually this type of work kind of fades away because the people that have been with us for a while, you know, God forbid, unless they have an emergency, a broken tooth, some sort of trauma, an unexpected abscess, uh, this type of work doesn't really occur that much until, unless, again, a life-changing event occurs. Um, so that just illustrates the issue that a lot of offices we're going to be having in terms of not being to accept new patients and people that are looking, as well as there have been some uh, retirements uh, around the area, uh, some offices that are changing uh, owners or, or, you know, still uncertain what their future is going to be. So you can expect some of these patients also to come out into the community and look for a new dental practice. Moving on, uh, just quickly talking about the sterilization area. Uh, and stressing on the conservation of gloves. As you know, the price of gloves has shut through the roof and there's no signs once again of it slowing down. It's still a significant increase from what we were used to paying just a year and a half ago. Uh, one of the things that can conserve um, gloves is when we are uh, in the sterilization area, if we use 
the utility gloves while working on the sterilization area. This will minimize uh, us using uh, the gloves uh, that we usually would, would use for treatment for just regular uh, cleaning and sterilization. Uh, the gloves should be washed after using them. Always remember that. And if any case, you know, I've given this some thought, but if 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 you have avoided using the, the, uh, the utility gloves because you kind of feel uncomfortable sharing gloves in and out, although the hands, of course, have to be washed before putting the, the utility gloves on, uh, the utility gloves should be cleaned once finished using them, and then you wash your hands again. But if you wanted to, uh, you know, you get your own utility gloves, you can approach me and I can get more uh, so everybody can even have their own pair. I have no really no issues with that because long term we can save the treatment gloves that we need for you know for cleanings and uh, and other clinical work. Uh, this is one way little things that we do day in and day out uh, to try to minimize uh, spending, which can can keep us running the way we want to run. <clears throat> Moving on, uh, blood pressure. Before surgeries and root canals, this is something that we just continue doing because of uh, the COVID pandemic and not knowing and uncertain how uh, the rate of transmission through contact of surfaces was. So we kind of stopped it, you know, because it was one more thing that we had to clean and just, you know, at this point we, we would justify passing it. Now we know, know, now know that the data shows that transmission of SARS-CoV-2 through surface contact is unlikely. It's not that common. So I would like to restart the protocol of taking blood pressures before any surgeries or root canals. Um, the blood pressure cuff should be thoroughly cleaned after each use. You know, uh, uh, extractions, implants, or root canals, um, which are the main targets of, of when we should be doing taking the blood pressure, although hygiene uh, can take it as well before their procedures uh, that they're doing uh, if they see fit. But in, in the clinical side where the doctors work, this is not something that we do all the time. So, you know, cleaning the blood pressure cuff, letting it air out a little bit, it, it should be something that could be very manageable. But we certainly have to uh, start getting into the habit of doing this again, as uh, complications doing, doing any type of surgical procedure uh, that may require even being in paramedics in and not being able to report a blood pressure could be quite problematic for us in terms of how we can justify the way we uh, conducted our treatment. As a reminder for everybody, especially the new newer staff, it's something that we, you know, because we haven't been able to really do staff meetings and, and the way the schedule is, I don't foresee doing at least staff meetings like we used to uh, do them before. Uh, but one thing I want to emphasize for everybody, and especially for the newer staff, is I'm a strong believer of professional development through continuing education. All our team members interested in continuing education should make the administration aware due to the fact that we will reimburse all or portion off the cost. Of course, one thing uh, that I want to remind each other, everybody, I'm sorry, is that the, there is a yearly limit and it varies according to how our office is performing and what subject matter you bring to me. So, uh, you know, if, if you bring a, a course that you want to take or either online or, or in presence, um, depending on what the subject matter is, I, I will reimburse it um, and also you know, if you're bringing several during the year, which I uh, completely support, it may not be, I may not be able to do a reimbursement on every each of them, but I will find a way to help you out because I do believe that all of us, the only way we can stay current and provide excellent care is through continuing education and always reading and learning more and more. Now that uh, things uh, for the moment have settled down with the COVID pandemic, we are starting to see again, continuing education courses, li uh, courses live, but there's also a, a high demand for online courses that are, are starting to be offered even more than before. I wanted to talk about a little bit quickly about the Excelsior Pass. I want to clarify a little bit how this works. I know there's still a little bit of confusion among the staff, so I want to make sure. Uh, one of the things that is very important to understand is that we're a medical facility. I have a medical record that requires a completely updated medical history with a new disease, just like I, you know, I used the example the other day you know, in the 80s when, when HIV uh, started occurring. Of course, there was a lot of uh, uh, question marks of how transmission was, et cetera, but it changed our profession at that moment. And we're, uh, we're going through another watershed moment where there's gonna be some permanent changes in the way we practice dentistry. Uh, and as part of a medical history, just like we ask somebody if they have diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, HIV, tuberculosis, et cetera, uh, hepatitis, we, we now have to include uh, what, is called, uh, what it is essentially an airborne disease. Uh, the fact that we're asking if you're vaccinated or not is 
A, a risk assessment tool, but B, most importantly, if we do have an exposure to COVID in the office, uh, it is uh, my responsibility to be able to track where everybody was, uh, medical history, status, et cetera, as I'm reporting things to the health department plus notifying the patients. Um, so one of the ways that somebody can bring this is through the Excelsior Pass. Uh, they'll probably, they'll show you your phone and you're gonna see either one, two things, either the left side, which is, it looks like a card, or they'll show you right away because they're familiar with it, the right side, which is the QR code. Now, if they show you just the card like you're seeing there, that is not sufficient. All we have to do is we just have to click on the card that we're looking at and it'll show the QR code. So in other words, some people show that card, they just don't know that by pushing on that card, the QR code will show. Then, now, once I get the QR code and it can be printed, uh, you know, or, or, or a screenshot can be sent if for any reason I'm not available, but my phone, this is a screenshot of my phone that you're seeing right now. It's, I know it's hard to, a little bit to see, but there's two applications there. Uh, one is the Excelsior Pass because I have my Excelsior Pass there, but another one is uh, the one that is the QR code reader. I registered the office as a business, and then once we did that, anytime that I see that QR code, I, I, I just basically go to that application, I read the QR code, and if it's valid, I'll see in my screen a green a green check mark. And we usually what we're doing is I'll just take a screenshot of that, send the screenshot encrypted through our email system, and the administrative staff puts it in the medical history with the check mark. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of forgery happening with with uh, COVID vaccine cards. So the idea originally through this was to make it easy for people to carry, the secure way to carry it, so you don't have to be carrying your little cards around where you can lose them or be stolen. Um, and it is also a way that a business like ours or a medical facility like ours, I'm sorry, can verify the, the, that this is actually a true uh, vaccination card. So if somebody shows you the Excelsior Pass, just remember, I have to read it. I have the reader on my phone. It's very simple. If by any reason somebody doesn't feel comfortable going into my phone, uh, it's just a matter of me somehow getting that QR code screenshot. And uh, even if it's saved in the computer, I can just read the QR code of our, of our own computer and get the, the, the green check mark. As a review of HIPAA, which we should be doing every month, it's been a little difficult here and there because of the way we're doing communication now. But I wanted to review the security rule. Uh, and this is an example in December, it's December 2017. Uh, there was a, a compliance review of uh, an institution, institution called Peach State to determine its compliance with the HIPAA privacy and security rule. Investigations found systemic non-compliance with the HIPAA security rule, including failures to conduct an enterprise-wide risk analysis, implement risk management and audit controls, and maintain documentation of HIPAA security rule policies and procedures. The HIPAA security rule establishes a national standard to protect individuals, electronic personal health information that is created, received, used, or maintained by a covert entity. The security rule requires appropriate administrative, physical, and technical safeguards to ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and security of electronic protected health information. As part of a security rule, a full risk assessment must be performed, which I have I've done before, it's been a couple of years since I just last did it. Usually this is a task I, I have to undertake myself and it's quite time consuming. Uh, and uh, this year, I know we were behind on this. So I do know that, you know, COVID obviously uh, and the backlog of work that we have faced have put me behind on doing another review. Uh, currently in the next few months, one of the things I have to do is actually uh, check all these things in terms of HIPAA compliance and also look at the OSHA uh, manual and make sure that we're updated. Again, these are things that have been left a little bit behind due to the test after and over and COVID, of course, uh, but really any uh, agency doesn't really care about those excuses. So I have to start working because most of the time, if you're showing you're working on them, uh, they'll give you kind of a pass uh, and a contingent to uh, showing that you finished the work. So this is uh, a review of the HIPAA security rule because part of a HIPAA uh, 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 studies and, and, and uh, evaluations that you have to do every so often with the testing that the staff should be getting. This is actually one of the classic questions of what is the security rule. So with that, we finished the first portion of, of, of this video, which is the uh, kind of the, re uh, the monthly report that you guys get. I try to make it quick and concise so we can go to the next part, which is the uh, much anticipated update uh, by OSHA. 
uh, they basically protecting workers. Uh, it's the guidance, the guidance of mitigating and preventing the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace. I started working on this uh, a little bit ago when I first came out uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, just in the last couple of days, I had to stop and re uh, check everything out because then New York came out with what they are calling New York Hero Act, which is an infectious disease, airborne infectious disease exposure prevention plan. It kind of ties up with everything like this. Um, that uh, OSHA was coming out with, uh, making sure that the rules are clear for any establishments, uh, medical or otherwise, uh, in terms of worker safety when there's an airborne infectious disease. So, the HERO Act, uh, the purpose of this, uh, of this plan is to protect employees against exposure and disease during an airborne infectious disease outbreak. The plan goes into effect when an airborne infectious disease has been designated by the New York State Commission of Health as highly contagious, communicable disease that presents a serious risk of harm to the public health. The plan is subject to any additional or greater requirements arising from a declaration of a state of emergency due to an airborne infectious disease, as well as any applicable federal standards. Um, basically, this always works this way. At, federal, at the federal level, there's gonna be a standard. And they, they always have this caveat saying, whatever the state standard is, if it's above the federal standard, then you file the state. If the state is below, you file the federal. So this is a general statement I have to include, unless otherwise required by federal, state, local, tribal, or territorial laws, rules and regulations, most employers no longer need to take steps to protect their fully vaccinated workers who are not otherwise at risk from COVID-19 exposure. Uh, this is a very important distinction and it's a general statement that one has to make uh, in terms of what we are discussing. You know, if you're working in a COVID ward, if you're in a hospital, where you're treating active COVID patients, believe me, I read it, it is a completely uh, different ballpark. But if you are uh, meeting certain requirements, which we'll talk in a little bit, the requirements are completely different if your staff is vaccinated. So there's a difference between having vaccinated employees and unvaccinated employees and how you deal with them. The guidance focuses only on protecting unvaccinated or otherwise at, otherwise at risk workers in their workplace or a well-defined portion of workplaces. The recommendations are advisory, advisory in nature and informational in content and are intended to only assist employers in providing a safe and healthful workplace free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm. So that's a general statement that OSHA uh, goes uh, and, and makes very clear from the beginning. And uh, then we realized, you know, when I first got the OSHA uh, rules coming out of the revision of the rules with the statement, and I, I started working on it right away, quite an extensive document. Uh, thankfully, a day or so later, uh, the American Dental Association came out with uh, their own statement, bringing to our attention exemption III, that is basically when you're not treating active COVID patient, this exemption includes dentistry uh, in most cases, uh, that basically dentistry is largely exempt from the emergency temporary standard by virtue of exemption II. What that says is that non-hospital ambulatory care settings where all non-employees are screened prior to entry and people with suspected or co confirmed COVID-19 are not permitted to enter those settings. So all these recommendations, the stricter part of them, <clears throat> basically uh, will not apply to us <clears throat> because we are not treating COVID-19 patients. Uh, and this is the statement I have to make clear. Dental Health Solutions will not perform any dental procedures or any other service on suspected active COVID patients. In other words, if they don't pass our screening at the, at the beginning of the appointment, if they're showing any signs or symptoms of COVID-19, uh, if they're calling on the phone reporting any signs or symptoms of COVID-19, vaccinated or not vaccinated, they cannot be seen. As we know, the vaccine, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about it, will protect uh, most individuals, a high percentage of the individuals from uh, showing any symptoms even when infected, when they do, they're mild, very rare cases of hospitalizations, if at all. Um, but we still, even if you're showing symptoms, <clears throat> we need to reschedule because we cannot take that risk. If we would be seeing patients with symptoms, then we would fall 
on the other side of the coin. So, but, so there's requirements, basically. Dental Health Solutions, in order for a dental office like Dental Health Solutions to fall under exemption III, we must continue following the, 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 some key provisions. Pre-appointment screenings are still necessary. You know, our policy of not seeing patients that are symptomatic. And again, answering the following questions that we'll review. Everyone, patients, non-employees on site and staff must be screened prior to entry and those with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 are not permitted to enter. I must emphasize uh, the point about uh, non-employees, you know, uh, any delivery person, any person that's coming from us out, we have to, uh, if they're entering the, the building, for example, for maintenance, they still have to be screened regardless of vaccination status. Dental Health Solutions has updated risk assessments to, for COVID-19. We, I had a risk assessment form done last year as required by New York State uh, and the federal level as well. And now uh, they are warning us it has to be uh, updated uh, with all the new materials that we have. So we are going to review that because that's part of this requirement that I must review with you guys uh, all our provisions, which you are all very familiar with. This is going to sound very, uh, very similar to what we're doing already. A state OSHA or their regulatory bodies may enact a more stringent standard, including one that does cover dental offices. Again, this is what I was telling you early on. Right now, we're under exemption III. Federal and state level seems to cover us in, in, under, under this exemption, but things can change and they make it different for dental offices if they see fit. Dental health solutions will continue to screen staff and none other patients entering their practice. Uh, so we can, again, uh, know that if there is no COVID, COVID post-positive individuals entering the, the office. Uh, employees must continue to screen themselves. Uh, we are doing self-screens with self-temperature, and we are writing it down. That is going to continue to be done. It has to be done. Uh, the directive states very clear that we must provide and ensure employees use respirators and other PPE for exposure to people with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 and for aerosol procedures on a person with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. So what this mean is this, respirators are mandatory if we would be treating COVID-19 patients or symptomatic individuals, but we're not. So we'll talk a little bit about that now, but that makes it very clear where they stand with respirators and dental care. Um, aerosol generating procedures, uh, of course, uh, we need to review, include dental procedures involving ultrasonic scalers, high-speed dental hand pieces, air water syringes, or polishing and air abrasion. Once again, I have to emphasize, no active COVID-19 patients or suspected COVID-19 patients will be treated. Any patient that fo fails the screening will have to be rescheduled. Note that respirators <clears throat> or um, N95s not mentioned as required when treating patients who are not suspected or confirmed with COVID-19. Uh, and that is a, a very important distinction. So moving forward, we will continue to allow voluntary use of respirators instead of, of a face mask, again, uh, surgical masks. Uh, and this would fall under what they call the mini respiratory protection program. Uh, we so far, you know, I've been strongly uh, encourage and pretty much just supply respirators uh, in the form of KN95 because that's what we would be we could find for a while. <clears throat> but at this moment, uh, it is optional the use of the respirators. Uh, why is it optional? So when you are using when when an employer has to require the use of a respirator, because again in the case of COVID-19 or let's say somebody that's treating somebody with tuberculosis, they have to use an N95 mask because they're treating active air, uh, patients with airborne disease. Um, and when you're using a respirator, when it's part of the PP that you have to wear as an employee, there are certain requirements that have to be met, including fit testing and medical evaluations. So what uh, OSHA has done is that they came up with a term mini respiratory program, which is designed to improve worker protection with limited provisions for the safe use of respirators that can be implemented more quickly and easily than the more comprehensive respiratory protection program, okay? <clears throat> so there's no medical evaluation, there's no fit testing. <clears throat> if you see this table, sorry, if you see this table right here, you can see that under the mini respiratory program, you only have to do CO checks and some training, which we'll do today because we have to review as part of the requirement. If you see on the other side, that respiratory protection program, 
There's medical evaluation, fit testing, written, uh, a written program has to be created. You see CO checks and train. <clears throat> so this is quite a, 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 an undertaking. And that's one of the reasons why they allowed respirators to be used, but again, on a voluntary basis from the employee. As an employer, I am making them available for whoever wants to use them. And again, once again, we see that the uh, how does the apply uh, the mini respiratory protection program applies. Um, basically, under the this mini program, in place of a face mask or a surgical mask, you use the respirator, but it's not required. So, in other words, like I use it every time, I'll continue to use the KN95s I have, uh, but it's voluntary because I'm not treating anybody with COVID-19. Uh, if I needed to switch to a level three mask, for example. I would switch to a level three mask and, and that because we have the flexibility and we have the supply. So when we're looking in terms of part of the training and things that we need to review, uh, this is a guide to face mask selection and use. Now, in the past, we would sometimes have level one, level two, because that would be what we would be using. But I want you to pay attention to, you know, where the N95 or respirators fall. They have similar level of protection to moisture, and droplets than the level three, but because of their superior fit, they are the ones that actually will protect you against airborne pathogens. That's why, again, a respirator is used for somebody that needs to uh, treat somebody with active tuberculosis, in this case that we're talking today, COVID-19. <clears throat> for an individual that, that are, tr are doing treatment like us in the dental office, it has been found that it's perfectly acceptable to use a surgical mask as long as you know that they're not treating an active COVID patient. Even more so, a fully vaccinated staff also brings another factor of protection or level of protection. But the level three mask and a respirator is very comparable in many of the other factors uh, that define a mask. Right now, <clears throat> as we stand, the KN95s are still available for everybody to use them. Our supply is strong, cost has not gone down, but I'm going to still continue to supply and, and try to restock. Everybody will get their bags. We'll talk a little bit about how we, we're using them currently and why. But we also have a, a now a new uh, stash of level three masks. Uh, if you choose to use level three masks, you can choose to use level three masks. You combine if you want. Uh, it's perfectly fine. Again, always be mindful of maximizing our personal protective equipment due to shortages that we have uh, seen in the past. And we never know if they're going to come back again. So basically, that's where we stand. <clears throat> As a review required here, remember that when we are dealing with a respirator, when we're placing them on, you never touch the inside. Always touch it from the outside. This is more of an N95 respirator. We, we're using the KN95s, but you would try to handle it the same way. Put the straps on the back and check the, 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 the seal fit. Most of the time, the way you check the seal is once it's in place. You can put your clean hands <clears throat> close or over the mask and to the sides, as you're seeing that picture, breathe in and breathe out, and you can kind of gauge how much leakage you're feeling and how proper the seal is. Again, if respirators were required, you have to do a, a seal check, um, and it's very clearly defined. This is not a COVID thing. This has always been a, a hospital protocol for uh, people that are treating airborne diseases. <clears throat> so sometimes one person is going to use one type of respirator, another person is going to use another type of respirator because it's what fits you best. Um, most of us have been content. I do when I put my N95, <clears throat> the way it fits me, it fits me very well. I do feel a little leakage here and there, but it's nothing significant. I feel comfortable with it. But it's very important that when you're putting it on, you make sure it fits you properly uh, if you're looking uh, to use a respirator of any kind. It is important that when we're removing the respirator, we do not touch the front uh, because that is the contaminated area of the mask. We always handle it through the straps, as you can see in the picture. And then we discard it, discard it and again, washing your hands, which is something we'll emphasize a little bit later on. Um, washing your hands is a critical component of daily uh, patient care. Now, one thing that we need to emphasize, and I think... Uh, continue to be sure that we're using it is the face shields. <clears throat> the face shields do not provide any type of protection against airborne diseases, but as part of our personal protective equipment, it is helping us minimize the droplets that fall in our face, glasses, 
and uh, the mask, either level three or uh, a respirator mask. We are minimizing those droplets. That one of the ways we can maximize or extend the use of that mask. Um, many of you have, you know, grabbed different, gravitated through different uh, 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 face shields. Uh, you know, when we came back uh, from COVID, you know, financials were an issue. I could only provide certain types. Some of you liked the types I was providing. Other of you were very, very good at looking at your own face shields that would fit very well. <clears throat> right now, as, as some of the disposable ones are starting to fade away in supply, I encourage the the, the staff, uh, some, of, some of the assistants, for example, I know they have their own face shields. You can see them on the right side. They're very comfortable. I, I had a few, I think, now that they're pretty much all in use right now. Uh, they're very good for, for the hygienists. Uh, 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 right now, you could you could check those ones out, see if they fit your loop, the ones on the right. They're very comfortable, and I will order you these reusable face shields. They last very long. The only thing that has to be changed is the cover. And, um, you know, right now, I, uh, I've seen the, the, uh, the assistants wear them for a while. Assistants. <clears throat> when this, once this cover needs to be replaced, this is the responsibility of Dental Health Solutions. Although I do know that you purchased the face shield initially because you knew that we could only supply what we could supply. Uh, and, and, but at this point, this is part of the personal protective equipment that I would supply. On the left side is the face shield I finally found and I, I absolutely love uh, because it is extremely comfortable with whatever loop it's adjustable. So it, that can be moved back and forth, the face shield, to fit the, the, the loop. Uh, I absolutely love it as well. I have one in each treatment room for myself. Please, again, uh, clinical staff, if you want to try that one out, see how it fits you. If you would like me to order that for you, let me know. But as we are moving away from the disposable ones, you know, eventually, you know, they gotta be, they got to be thrown out. I know we have been extending their use quite well because of the cleaning that we do. But eventually, we're going to run out of them, and I much rather move to a reusable face shield where only the, the cover has to be changed. One last thing I want to highlight uh, the face shield that I use. If you're using loops, the, this, they, this uh, face shield on the, on the left side, the, the one with the green top, was designed by dentists. And actually, the light of the, of the, of the, of the, he, of the loops doesn't get muffled or doesn't get dimmed down because they specifically designed it for dentists and, and, and hygienists that are wearing uh, loops with a light. So it is an excellent facial, it's the best facial <coughs> that I found and I experimented with a lot. Now, <coughs> we've been using, we, we, we started doing, you know, extended use uh, uh, from the beginning. Uh, it basically, the CDC defines extended use as wearing the same respirator for repeated close contact with people without removing it. Uh, the agency instructs compliance officers that extended use or reuse. We, at the beginning, I'm sorry, when we came back with COVID, because of the short supply, we were applying reuse principles of the respirators uh, that we were using. When uh, supply became better, we started doing extended use with the purpose of what? We're treating patients, we're in the clinical area, we're not removing the mask. I don't want you guys to be removing it too much, especially there was no vaccine out, you know, no protection. Um, and basically what I was asking you guys is just to keep it on, you know, and if you remove it, remove it correctly, store it while you were having lunch and then put it back on. That's what we, That was one of the, the main ideas of continuing going from reuse when we didn't need to do that again anymore, to extended use where uh, we were trying to minimize the time that you don't have a mask for the clinical staff. Um, but right now, um, it, it may, may, be, may be permitted as long as the respirator what, maintains its structural and functional integrity and the filter material is not physically damaged, soiled, or contaminated. So we got to remember this. If we're extending the use of the respirator or the level 3 mask, it is very important that if you identify that this mask has been compromised, change it. There is no need to be uh, uh, using something that is not protecting you. At this time, if you choose to wear a respirator ex for extended time, use is encouraged as long as the respirator is not compromised. So you can continue doing the extended principles uh, because, again, it, it just facilitates and lowers the level of risk for uh, the clinicians that are involved in aerosol-producing uh, procedures. But you are able to change this respirator during the day as you see fit. You could do it 
uh, you know, if everything has gone fine, you're using your face shield, the respirator seems integral, you want it to have one for the morning, one for the afternoon, it's perfectly fine. Again, like I said, uh, being judicious with our supply, we can, you know, we can change uh, a level three mask to a respirator if need be. So we're starting to have a little bit more freedom, but extended use principles can still be applied because it minimizes the contact with the mask as you're working, you keep that mask on, you're cleaning the room, et cetera, et cetera. Because again, we're not treating active COVID patients, we're not treating symptomatic patients, but as we all know, there could be pre-COVID patients or pre-symptomatic patients that we may be treated that may be shedding the virus and wearing this mask constantly on clinical areas or areas that we interact with the public uh, regardless of vaccination status, although uh, if you're dealing with a patient that's vaccinated, your risks are extremely low. Uh, but again, we still have to uh, uh, use caution because we are not seeing one person, we're seeing several during the day. And we need to understand that exposure to one would meet a chain reaction of exposures that we wanna try to minimize. If we're wearing the mask, that means that uh, that chain reaction, we are minimizing the risk to others. Now, one of the things that we need to review it as a requirement by the OSHA standards. The last time when uh, the staff came back to work, there was an extensive, uh, I think it was uh, several, I don't remember, four hours probably of training coming back, even more perhaps. Uh, and we're doing another training. This is not going to be four hours, but we got to do some reviews here, uh, assuming that most of you remember everything and understanding that if you have any questions, concerns, or needs for clarification, please don't hesitate to reach out. So we have provided the necessary training in language and literacy level that employees understand and so that the employee comprehends at least the following. How the disease spread, we need to review that. We need to uh, understand and, uh, and uh, review the office policies and patient encounters, cleaning routines and et cetera. What and when the proper PPE is to be worn and employer employee policies are on all aspects, including but not limited to the use of common areas such as the employee break room. So as part of the training that I have to do for you guys, and this is probably gonna be something that is gonna be now part of the OSHA overall training, just like tuberculosis is and HIV is, this is gonna be probably part of it as well. So let's do some uh, quick reviews here. Um, how is the disease spread? Well, COVID-19, I think we all know that it's it spreads when an infected person breathes out droplets and then very small particles that contain the virus. These droplets and particles can be breathed in by other people or land in on their eyes, nose, or mouth. In some circumstances, they may be contaminated surfaces they touch. Again, this has been shown to be um, of a much lesser impact at, or none at all, this last point. People who are closer than six feet from infected persons are most likely to get infected. COVID-19 is spread in three main ways. Breathing in air when close to an infected person who is exhaling small droplets and particles that contain the virus. Having the small droplets and particles that contain virus lying on the eyes, nose, or mouth. And touching eyes, nose, or mouth with hands that have that virus on them. That's why hand washing is so critically important. So how does he spread in this uh, illustration? And one of the videos that you're asked to review, you'll see some of this information. But of course, we know there's big droplets, there's little droplets. There was a lot of controversy at the beginning. Which one is the, the one that causes it? Is it the big droplets that fall between three feet? Is it the little droplets that can travel a long way? You know, the bigger droplets are the ones that transmit something like a virus, like Ebola. Uh, measles, highly contagious, super contagious disease, can travel in very small droplets. That's one of the reasons they can travel beyond those six feet. So, you know, what we know right now as we stand is that the COVID-19 can spread through both droplets. Uh, definitely amount of virus is critical. Exposure time is critical. So in other words, if you're around somebody that has COVID-19, but you were, even if we were closer than six feet, but your interaction was not prolonged, I think, you know, they still toy with those 10 to 15 minute uh, window, you are less likely to be infected. That's where the mask came into play as well as a reduction of risk. Uh, but if you are in a room, even if you're not within six feet, but the room has poor ventilation um, and, and these droplets can fly around, the smaller droplets can fly around, or you are in, in, the, in the path of air circulation in a poorly ventilated room, you can get uh, then COVID-19 by the smaller droplets but by also the combination of constant exposure. So droplets, it's an airborne disease. It's all about air circulation, and that is the main driver of the disease. So 
again, some general point, COVID-19 may be more under control, but it has not disappeared in the United States, and it will, at this moment, it seems unlikely that it will disappear. Nearly 2,000 are still being hospitalized for COVID-19 every week in the United States. The rise of the more infectious Delta variant means people who have not yet been vaccinated could be at higher risk of developing the disease. This has been shown constantly. Where hospitalization rates remain high, the patients have one thing in common, they're unvaccinated. And this is, I've, I've looked at the individual numbers. <clears throat> I have tools where I can look at just states uh, separately. And, uh, and then you look and you relate to the vaccination rates and just the numbers uh, basically don't lie. As a result though, we're seeing that more young people are being admitted to hospitals. Older people and those with underlying conditions have a high rate of vaccination. We'll show you some numbers later. Basically, you know, the, the vaccination rate in the United States is stagnant at about 5, 55, 57%, I think it was. Um, so that's the general population. But when actually, when you, when you, when you isolate the, the uh, older age groups, it gets closer to 70%. So that's why you're not seeing as many older patients now in the hospitals, like at the beginning of the pandemic. Now you're actually seeing younger people, like a, a case I just read, a 28-year-old, uh, no underlying medical conditions, entire family actually was vaccinated except for him. Um, and uh, he, his only thing was that he did um, uh, 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 use the vape pen and uh, <clears throat> he contracted COVID and uh, double uh, lung transplant he ended up having. Uh, so the entire family uh, was around him, everybody was vaccinated, everybody was okay. He got COVID and had uh, 20 year, year, 28 years old, a double lung transplant. People with uh, COVID-19 have had a wide range of symptoms reported, ranging from mild symptoms to severe illness. Symptoms may appear uh, 22 to 14 days after exposure to the virus. Anyone can have the mild to severe symptoms. People with these symptoms may have COVID-19. So as a review, fever or chills, cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle or body aches, headaches, obviously new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion or running nose, nausea or, vo nausea or vomiting, and diarrhea. So that's a review of COVID-19. A lot of people are already aware of it. A lot of people are very aware that if they're displaying any symptoms, they probably should stay home. One of the biggest concerns now is as people are becoming more relaxed with this and more adventurous, they are going out uh, even if symptomatic. You're starting to see the effects of not wearing masks all the time as the reports of colds have gone up quite a bit of course now you have a cold you go you gotta get tested for COVID uh, but you're seeing a lot of more colds where uh, that was uh, kind of not very reported among the general population uh, now when to seek mer medical emergency medical attention uh, we have to look for these warning signs if someone is showing any of them you have to go to the emergency care trouble breathing persistent pain or pressure in the chest new confu confusion inability to wake or stay awake pale gray or, gray or blue colored skin, lips or nail beds, depending on the skin tone. Now, a lot of these things I kind of went through with some main points because uh, uh, you know it's the, the staff that has been me, with me uh, since returning from COVID, the newer staff, I have to assume you have learned these things in your pre uh, previous places of employment. Um, this is all of you have a medical background or a medical office background. Uh, so this was a general review. One thing that we need to add now is all this fuss about variants. <clears throat> all viruses are made up of a bundle of genetic material, either DNA or RNA, that's covered by a, protein, uh, a protective coating uh, of proteins. Once a virus gets into your body, usually through your mouth or nose, it latches onto one of your cells. When that happens, the virus DNA or RNA enters the cells where it can make copies of a cell that go off and infect other cells. If the virus can copy itself and hijack enough of your cells without being wiped out by your immune system, that's how you get sick. Now, every now and then, an error occurs during the virus copying process. That's a mutation. Most of the time, mutations are so small that they don't significantly affect how the virus works, or they make the virus weaker, actually. But occasionally, a mutation helps the virus copy itself or get into your cells more easily. This illustration, <clears throat> very simple illustration, like shows, you know, 
the, the, the virus A, uh, the little thing that looks like a helicopter is a representation of the antibody. So the antibodies, like for those of you that have been vaccinated, your antibodies now know how to recognize the coding and they attach and attack. They know what to do, right? Your body has the soldiers to attack this. Now, if their mutation occurs, as you see in virus B, uh, and now the coding has changed, the antibody doesn't recognize it. It's not as effective against. Now, these coatings can have no significance whatsoever. These coatings can make something more contagious. Uh, uh, something's less contagious as well. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes the coatings can affect somebody, in, the, in our case of COVID-19, it can affect people that are unvaccinated more pronounced or, or it can spread easier. Um, and, and people that are vaccinated will have some or all protection against variants. But <clears throat> this is a very concerning situation because the low levels of vaccination and the virus's ability to continue spreading around will cause more mutations. We go to the flu, which is not a good example, but we, you know, in terms of comparisons, but we kind of use it sometimes, right? We cannot think of this as a flu, but the flu, one of the difficulties that we have, of course, is that we don't know what mutations, why is going to be more prevalent. Also, the flu has a high rate of mutation. It can mutate in different ways. I just represented one way. There's a couple of principal ways that a virus can mutate. <clears throat> but for the sake of this discussion, I just want to illustrate how mutations work. Um, but the flu can, 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 can mutate rather quickly. That's what makes it so difficult to create a vaccination for it. That's what makes it so difficult to keep it under control. That's, what, that's why it's an endemic virus. COVID-19 mutates. We've seen it already. We know that. It mutates at a, at a low, slower rate than the, the flu, which is a good thing because, A, it may not vary as much as the flu, but also, B, could give us some time, right, to anticipate some of these mutations or look at these mutations before they become too problematic and act on them, especially because we have the new, not new, but the, the technology now finally used of mRNA, mRNA vaccines or these type of vaccines that work different from the traditional ones that can be modified in order to uh, counteract a mutation. Now here, you know, again, I just wanted to show you a table of all the disease and how they spread uh, and, and the different variants that we have been seeing, what are considered variants of concern and variants of interest. As you can see, this is a list that, you know, when I grabbed it, this is the list right now, but uh, two weeks from now, the list may change. This is to illustrate that I constantly am looking. Uh, this is actually... Every day I could just put a new a new chart, of course. I believe I put this one last Thursday. But I'm always looking <clears throat> at what is happening in our county, Onondaga County and New York overall, as I'm assessing risk levels, as I make decisions of how we <clears throat> proceed with our daily activities. Right now, Oswego County has a 47% vaccination rate compared to at this point. Uh, and it's, I can tell you that it's kind of staying the same. I think it was 48% today. Uh, this has not moved very quickly in Oswego County. Uh, and the vaccination rate of New York is about 55%. I think it was 56, 57 uh, when I checked it today at the time of this recording. And But because of the infection rate and how people are getting infected, Oswego County currently is considered a low-risk uh, area for uh, getting uh, the COVID-19. Nevertheless, though, if the Delta variant, for example, which is the one that has become prevalent in the United States, uh, like it has happened in other countries because of its high infectiveness, um, <clears throat> if Oswego County has the makings of an area where this uh, variant could spread rather quickly if it hits us because of this is a, a low vaccination rate. If you look at Onondaga County, which is the next biggest county that we have, uh, these vaccination rates stalled, but it moves daily. It's creeping up to the 60% mark. Um, again, you, you will see that the major vaccination rate is 55% because it's the same day I'm looking at. Uh, but because of the density of the population and other factors, uh, uh, including vaccination rate, Onondaga County is considered a moderate risk area <clears throat> because that's how we're seeing the uh, disease spread. Um, again, Delta could cause a problem with Onondaga County as well, although the vaccination rates are higher. One would have to look at the vaccination rate of younger individuals, which is, which is low. And again, overall New York, uh, better than a lot of states, not as good as I know they wish it was. It's staying at 55%. Uh, cases are starting to creep up in the city. We have to watch uh, uh, you know, carefully 
uh, the Delta variant as it moves, and I am watching as it moves through New York State. It's still right now not the widely reported variant, uh, but it will overtake it. You know, Delta was second in the country behind Alpha, and in a matter of a few days, it became the most prominent virus that is found in all new COVID-19 patients. So when we're talking about risk assessment, we have to understand that our current staff is fully vaccinated as of July 1st of this year. But <clears throat> we will continue taking their temperatures. I, have, I cannot emphasize this anymore. We cannot become lax in these protocols in order to fall under the exemption III. And self-monitoring is important upon entry to the building. And the staff displaying symptoms will not be able to enter. Return to work will be determined by case basis. And generally, <clears throat> fully vaccinated dental health care personnel will continue to wear source control while at work. However, fully vaccinated uh, dental health care personnel could dine and socialize together in break rooms and conduct in-person meetings without source control or physical distancing. If unvaccinated personnel, which we don't have at this point, are present, then it's a different set of rules. Uh, you know, I would have to just create uh, that uh, protocol if we ever do include a non-vaccinated uh, staff member. Uh, going back to the fully vaccinated dental health care personnel, you know, now that if you're having lunch, I mean, we don't have to separate anymore. We can re we can put the chairs back in only in the uh, break room. Uh, vaccinated uh, patient, uh, employees, I'm sorry. You know, you don't have to uh, wear a mask. You can share a desk if you want to uh, and share a meal together. If uh, a fellow staff member prefers to continue dining alone and good in precautions, it's perfectly fine. This is a individual preference type of thing. Uh, but this not wearing masks among vaccinated individuals only includes, and we'll review this in a little bit again, uh, areas that are uh, uh, basically the break room or employee only areas. Patients, patients will not be seen if symptomatic. I, I got to repeat that a thousand times. Temperatures will have to continue to be taken upon entry into the building. <clears throat> All patients will be screened prior to the dental visiting. The following, th the following is what has to be assessed on a screening at this time. Vaccination status, experiencing any symptoms of COVID-19 in the past 14 days, tested positive for COVID-19 in the past 14 days, and or been in close proximate contact with confirmed or suspected COVID-19 cases in the past 14 days. All patients will be instructed to reporting symptoms that may have developed after the dental visit. I do believe that I do mention this a little bit later. I, I, I think if I remember correctly. But if you are a, you are if you are a vaccinated patient that we have proved that you're vaccinated, and you do report that you were in contact with somebody with COVID nineteen and you do not have any symptoms, you can still be seen. <clears throat> okay, because that's is a very low probability probability that you are carrying even the virus. Um, so that is okay because a vaccinated individual uh, is showing a different. Uh, issue when you know or no issues at all when they are exposed to COVID-19 um, but if the vaccinated individual is symptomatic no 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 until we know uh, otherwise that it was not COVID um, you know if somebody has a cold they might go to the doctor or th th if they're vaccinated they have a cold they may go to the doctor and the doctor says I tested you you just have a cold we're fine they're vaccinated we're okay <clears throat> if they're vaccinated they have a cold two days later they feel better they're calling back their symptoms are gone <clears throat> even though they didn't go to the doctor, but they're vaccinated, they're feeling perfectly fine, they can still be seen because they're vaccinated. The likelihood that that cold was just a cold is very high. All right? Always remember, guys, if you have questions about how to follow up with some of these situations, just ask me. Um, and, and and again, all these experiencing patients, uh, experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 in the four, last 14 days, et cetera, et cetera, all depend on vaccination status as well. Um. One of the things that we have to continue doing is crowd control. Social distancing measures have been implemented. This is not changing. Waiting room is accommodated for six feet distance between patients. No more than six patients can be waiting at one time. If the waiting room has six people waiting, then the patient will have to wait in their vehicle. Patients can still choose to wait in their cars if they want to. Only the patient being treated is allowed in the treatment area of the operating room, operative room. Uh, certain exceptions will be allowed for patients that need assistance. Remember, there is exceptions that you have to follow. People that need assistance or have caregivers, they may have to be allowed uh, legally in the room. No walkings are still continuing to be allowed. This is not going to change anytime soon. 
Hand sanitizers are still available upon entering the building and leaving the building, always encouraging hand washing. Patients will, will max at all times during active, except during active treatment. Vaccinated patients that have shown proof of vaccination can choose not to wear a mask. One of the things we have to remember, guys, is our office, this is before COVID, we're not an office that crowds people because we're triple booking. I mean, we do use to double book here and there, right? But we were always, you know, even even when our schedule was tighter, we were always running on time. We're not making people wait around. We are not in one of these places. I've worked on these places. You go in and the, the waiting room is like, I, there's people standing because they've been waiting 40 minutes for their appointment. Uh, we're not like that. We never had this issue. And the current schedule, how it is, provides for so much flexibility and breathing room in terms of we're not going to really face a lot of challenges with crowding in the waiting room. But, you know, if somebody brings a companion and they're medically needed, if the waiting room is clear, it's clear, it's okay. You know, there's nobody sitting there. But if patients need to take that waiting room and there's a companion that is not medically or, um, in, or legally needed, in the in the in the in the building, we may have to ask that individual to wait outside because we need to let our patients take a seat. But again, I don't foresee this being a problem with the way we we run things. <coughs> patients will be uh, directed to keep six feet apart when other patients are present. We must continue to direct traffic. We cannot allow people to be on touch of on top of each other. We're already seeing that this is going. Uh, overlooked by people, right? You're in the, the grocery store. One of the things I enjoyed tremendously was that nobody was behind me breathing on my neck, you know, as I'm waiting or putting my groceries down. Uh, they're so close sometimes that I'm wondering if they're reading my debit card, right? Uh, one of the nice things about COVID is that people finally stayed away and let you breathe when you were processing your 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 uh, your, your groceries uh, with the with the uh, by paying for, for paying for them, right? But now you're seeing people are on top of you again. So we have to be careful, right? We're a medical facility. We have a chain of people that we see during the day. You know, one one incident can trigger quite a, a, a trajectory of things that I have to follow. So what we want to do is, patient is done with treatment, direct them to the uh, uh, front area, uh, the administrative area, I'm sorry. And if they're crowded, uh, tell them to take a seat, wait for their turn. So that way everything, remember, has been located in such a way where everybody's always six feet apart. If the chairs are taken and people are being seen in the administrative area, then the patient has to stay in the operating room or the treatment room bef uh, until they, you are able to get them released. So uh, clinical uh, staff, we have to be very vigilant that we're not letting patients wander around the office because that's how people meet, start talking. Uh, this is not the grocery store. Respiratory ed etiquette uh, <clears throat> has to be emphasized. We have to make sure <clears throat> that we still have these uh, signs up uh, regarding respiratory etiquette and hand washing and all that stuff that has to stay up, that cannot go down. Um, because we know that infection disease can be spread by droplets expelled from the mouth and nose. Employees and patients should exercise appropriate respiratory etiquette by covering nose and mouth when sneezing, coughing, or yawning. All right, so this is our crowd control risk assessment measures that we are taking. We already talked about risk assessment, uh, how we deal with the staff. Again, we're vaccinated, so common staff employee-only areas. No masks, okay, because you're vaccinated. Um, uh, and then patients, crowd control is still essential. Now, what we call source control, and this is be besides the personal protective equipment, early on, <clears throat> understanding that this is an airborne disease, little droplets, big droplets, airflow issue. I st we studied the airflow in the building and in the operating rooms. Luckily, we have large operating rooms with openings, right? We're not closed. We're not closing a door. <clears throat> and um, we're also able to open windows, which is, by the way, allowed now as well. Uh, uh, vaccinated individuals with the source control that we have. Uh, we are okay. We can open the window uh, if you wish to, uh, to do so. But anyways, this little representation I made, you see on the right side, you see this yellow kind of rectangle and you see something like looks like water. It's actually meant to represent air. That's where the air comes out of, right? Each operating room, that's where the air is coming from, the HVAC system. So the air points there, right, Go going in our direction. So I quickly realized we have to control as the air is coming in our way and droplets are going into the environment. What can we do? So what did we do? We placed UV overhead units. <clears throat> the idea is droplets that are floating up to a certain level will be cleaned by the UV units. For those of you that are, are newer, UV units, uh, overhead UV units, like the ones we have in the treatment rooms, are known to be extremely effective in killing tuberculosis. 
So you see it in the hospital settings. Uh, <clears throat> and we know they kill COVID-19 as well. We know that now for sure. So that's one way we are source controlling droplets in the room. Of course, underneath that, what do we have? We have the IntelliPure uh, air purifiers specifically work with particles even smaller than the COVID-19 virus. We have that sucking up droplets that are falling through the through the system, right? So we got two things that are, are cleaning the air, turning the air over. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to turn the over air over in the operating room. Then as I was able to, then we added what? Uh, you know, when, when, the, when the dentist is working with the assistant, the high suction unit is held by the assistant for hygienists. What do we have? We have the leaf, which is a high speed suction unit at the source of the aerosols. One of the most effective things we can do is suction that those droplets right at the source, right? And then we added an extra oral unit. That's the little thing that looks like a lamp. That's why I, I, I put like a little leaf there. That's one of our source controls. And what looks like a lamp is meant to look like our extra oral <coughs> suction unit. As in the extra uh, the uh, 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 extra, extra oral suction unit, the closer it is to the mouth, the more efficient it's gonna be, 100%. We're vaccinated. We have all these source controls at the treatment room, right? Uh, this, even if it's hovering a little bit higher, just changing the circulation. Hey, grab whatever we can grab out of the air, okay? Because this goes through a filter inside that extra oral suction unit. So we have all controls inside the operating room, besides our personal protective equipment, to try to snap this, right? Or sap this. These uh, Intellipure pur purifiers are found in the break room, waiting room, as well as the administrative area. And those ones are specifically designed for that space. Adding to that, we have a place, and I for, actually, I forgot, I remember I took a picture and I wanted to show it to you guys. I may include it in the email uh, with these links. But we have installed UV purifying systems inside the HVAC unit. So we're actually filtering the air even more efficiently than before. So we're really addressing <clears throat> as much as we can the air quality issue inside the building. So if there is a COVID-19 exposure, there is less risk that the COVID-19 spread around the building or stayed around the building for a prolonged period of time. Surface analysis, this is still, you know, when you're looking at OSHA, when you're looking at the state level, they're still emphasizing the cleanliness of the surfaces. 100% agree, you guys are doing great with keeping all surfaces clean uh, and, and it's very important. We don't have to do this hyper cleaning every five seconds of commonly touched areas. We know this is not a common way to transmit COVID-19 that's been established. We, we still need to make sure that we're cleaning these commonly touched areas. Uh, and but, but nevertheless, although I do know that, we will continue not to offer magazines, toys, or coffee. And this is really done for two main things at this point. To minimize patient movement, so I don't want people gathering and to having coffee or kids, <clears throat> both of them being at the top of the toys. And the same with magazines, but also I don't want more things that we have to clean, right? So we're minimizing that. We don't have to clean as much uh, other things that we have to stay on top of because they would be commonly touched area. Uh, software surfaces will be continuing to be clean with e e EPA approved disinfectants that have been identified as effective as COVID-19. Guess what? It's what we've always used. It's nothing really different. And as a review, uh, most of you know, I don't think all of you know, uh, that we divided the uh, as part of the risk assessment analysis, we divided the uh, office in different risk zones uh, where there is higher likelihood or higher risk, lower risk. This is a layout of our office. The red represents the high risk. That is where uh, all treatment goes on. And part of the you know the administrative staff is exposed to this high risk area, although they sit technically what we call a medium. Oh, I'm sorry, a low risk area. Uh, where the employee common areas are. Uh, again, the administrative staff, administrative area is a tricky area. That's why there's barriers that have been established there to try to minimize, although the effectiveness of those barriers have come into question. I, I don't really think that they're that effective, but I want to keep them up. Uh, I think I touched that in a little bit just because I don't want people getting close to the administrator anyways. That's just a barrier so people don't lead into them, um, minimizing that risk. So red is clinical area. Uh, basically, you're, you're, you're treating patients, you're around patients, masks are all the way, all the time on, there's no ifs and buts about it, um, uh, low risk area, uh, that is, you know, where, where, where you are uh, sharing a space with fellow employees, I get in this case, all vaccinated, so if it's, it, we can call it the even lower risk area. And then the yellow uh, that you can see there, those are the common patient areas, 
uh, those would be consider considered uh, medium risk uh, because they don't spend a lot of time there. That is really even vaccinated or unvaccinated. People are not hanging out and we have to try to avoid it. Uh, don't mention what happened today. I know some of you are rolling your eyes, but you know we are going to encounter some challenges that are going to come along the way as people are relaxing and just assuming that everything is, is over and, and done with. We, we're patient and we, we battle each, each challenge as it comes. So basically, uh, we will continue. If you've been fully vaccinated and you've been around someone who has COVID-19, you do not need to stay away. This includes patients and employees. Uh, but if you have symptoms, that's a different story. So COVID-19 positive staff member, staff member, staff member that has positive, tested positive for COVID-19, once the diagnosis is confirmed, follow all medical recommendations, including any quarantine protocols. Quarantine protocols for vaccinated individuals is different from vaccinated individuals. Uh, you may be COVID-19 positive, vast majority just don't have any symptoms, and uh, that, that, the duration period is, is less that you have to be at home. We have to seek medical attention immediately, immediately if symptoms worsen, determine who may have had the COVID, contact with COVID-19. Uh, that would be my responsibility if I have an employee uh, that is tested COVID-19 positive when they were in the office. Uh, you've got to notify the office staff of the diagnosis and ask the following questions of each person. So I will be asking where was the last contact with this individual uh, that was diagnosed with COVID-19 and I need to get as detailed answers as possible. Some questions to ask include, what, who was the, what was the date of the last contact? How long was the contact? Who was the approximate distance of the contact? All right, so <clears throat> that's why be, before I pretty much spread everybody out, masks on unless eating all the time because that would minimize the risk if one of you were COVID-19 positive. We're gonna remember that even to this day, the uh, infection levels inside dental offices is uh, even below 1% at this point. And uh, the majority of the anecdotal cases that have been reported in the United States, the infections occur staff to staff. The patient to staff or staff to patient <clears throat> have not been confirmed uh, solid. There are anecdotal reports, but nothing confirmed. So, but confirmed have been, uh, although mostly anecdotal, but some a lot of them have been confirmed. And really, the infections around dental offices have been staff to staff, right? So our concern has always been what aerosol producing procedures, active care. Most offices have taken the basic necessary things that were asked of them. We have gone above and beyond the requirements. <clears throat> so in the clinical area, we are, as long as we are doing the things that are correct, our risks are very, very low. But if somebody has COVID-19, uh, even in vaccinated, there is gonna be some tracking. So if, if you are a vaccinated uh, employee that had COVID-19 positive, um, then, then I would have to track the other employees and there are certain questions and things that we may, may need to uh, ask of you, not to invade your privacy, but it's needed in terms of how we deal with the situation. Uh, we would have to clean and disinfect the environmental surface and dental facility according to the guidance, uh, guidance outlined in the CDC in terms of infection prevention and control guidance to the dental setting. So that's if a COVID-19 patient is present or an employee. There's some protocol that we have to follow in terms of how we clean the office. As the un unaffected staff to seek testing, if unvaccinated, and to keep the rest of the staff informed regarding that they tested when they received such results and what those results were, the progression of symptoms, any hospitalizations, and improvements. So <clears throat> if we were exposed to a COVID-19 patient, we're all vaccinated, we really don't have to stop coming to work because we're all vaccinated as long as we're not showing symptoms. Showing symptoms changes the, the game. That person stays home. The rest of the staff that is vaccinated can continue working as long as they're not vaccinated. But we may want to choose to seek some testing. And I would provide it in order to clarify if we have any vaccine positive patients, uh, employees among ourselves. And then, of course, I would have to deal with the patient side of things. Contact with patients who may have had contact with COVID-19 positive individual to, individual to determine whether they are symptomatic. Recommend that they self-quarantine for 10 days if unvaccinated, if unvaccinated, and notify their physicians if symptoms develop. We always will have to follow the recommendations of the CDC and our public health authority for additional steps. We would have to report to the New York State Health Department, verify with the CDC for any changes in protocols or recommendations. 
<coughs> the administrative staff, you will have to continue wearing your mask while in the uh, administrative area and interacting with patients. Clear, bar clear barriers, again, like I mentioned before, have been installed. Although we have to be aware the effectiveness of the barriers has come into question. Nevertheless, they will remain in place as a physical control, promoting distance between patient and administrator. Communication through the office should still continue to be done through dental link, just to minimize patient, I'm sorry, clinician or administrative movement. Uh, therefore, not moving from, like say, a low risk area to a high risk area and vice versa. Hand hygiene, <coughs> you know, uh, there's a video that I included in the links that is important that you review. I have to stress that is there's a strict attention to staff hygiene. Staff has to be clean hands thoroughly upon entry to the workplace, before and after any contact with the patients, and after contact with contaminated service or equipment, review the 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 uh, the, the link that I gave you there, uh, so you can review on, on, on hand washing techniques. But I must, must I can't have to I cannot emphasize this more. Hand hygiene is critical. Oh, and I'm sorry, as after removing PPE, refer to the ADA's uh, hand hygiene that I was mentioning. Clothing, we will continue to do what we've been doing. We'll be changed upon entry and after screening. Reusable gowns have to be used during active patient treatment. Change gowns if it becomes soil. You know, we were changing them every time. Uh, you guys choose what you feel comfortable with. Um, but again, because the surface con contact of surfaces is not a main driver of the disease, <clears throat> you don't have to change them as, as frequently if not visibly soiled or not soiled. Uh, if you're using a disposable gown under no circumstances, can you reuse that? That has to be uh, used to just one time. That is one of the reasons why I have always preferred reusable gowns. That way you can just, you know, change to another one if you need to easily. Clothes, cloth gowns should be laundered in-house. Of course, we all know that. Never walk out of the office with them on. We have to try to minimize walking with any PPE like gloves, contaminated gloves into uh, common uh, treatment area, uh, common employee areas. <clears throat> a reinforcement of the chair side protocols, limit the paperwork in the treatment room as much as possible. We will continue to cover, cover the keywords, keyboards with flexible clear barriers and uh, we change as much as we can between patients or clean them up really properly because it's a lot easier to clean that cover than it is to clean something like a keyboard. Limiting access to the treatment rooms to the patients only when possible. Supply a mask and shield to anyone who accompanies the patient. <coughs> Reminder, in certain circumstances, it may be impracticable to limit others in the treatment rooms when their presence is legally required, like translation service, service animals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if a patient is accompanied by a vaccinated individual and they're vaccinated, a mask would be sufficient. You don't have to wear a face shield. That's an older uh, protocol that we had that thankfully we didn't have to use a lot. If you're wearing, if you're removing your mask, do so outside the treatment rooms preferably. If the mask is soiled, damaged, or hard to breathe through, it must be replaced. Remember that. Use sand scaling rather than ultrasonic scaling when appropriate. High ev velocity ev ev evacuation should be employed whenever possible. That's the leaf. Shock your dental units in water lines if you're returning from an extended break in practice. We always have to remember to consult the manufacturer for proper product recommendations. So this uh, ends kind of like the review of these protocols. Now, <clears throat> everybody must know that the, the, this written plan, the risk assessment plan, the New York Hero Act filled out, they're a complement to each other. Um, the OSHA specific dental recommendations, which I condensed into one form, I have them all in a black folder. For the time being, they're just gonna be in my desk where I sit back in the clinical area. Anybody that wants to look them over and read them, is their right? You can go and access them, just ask, for, ask me for them and I'll give them to you. Uh, and anybody that needs clarification or has any questions about this or any recommendations, you are work welcomed. Now, as part of the, of the things I have to do, we must emphasize employee protections. I have to read the following. No, em no employee or his or her agent or person acting as or on behalf of a hiring entity or the office or agent of any entity, business, corporation, partnership, or limited liability company shall discriminate threaten, re retaliate, 
against or take any adverse action against any employee for exercising the right under this plan, including reporting conduct that employee reasonably believes in good faith violates the plan or airborne infection disease concerns <clears throat> to their employer, government agency, or officials, or for refusing to work when an employee reasonably believes in good faith that such work exposes him or her, other workers or the public to an unreasonable risk of exposure provided for the employee, another employee or representative has notified the employer verbally or in writing, including electronic communication of the inconsistent working conditions and the employer's failure to cure or if the employer knew or should have known of the consistent working conditions. <clears throat> Notifications of a violation by an employee may be made verbally or in writing and without limitation to format including electronic communications. To the extent that communications between the employer and the employee regarding a potential risk of exposure are in writing, they should be maintained by the employer for two years after the conclusion of the designation of a high-risk disease from the Commissioner of Health, or two years after the conclusion of the governance or mention declaration of, of high-risk disease. Employers should contact information to report violations of this plan and retaliation during regular business hours and of and for weekend and other non-regular business hours when employees may be working. So this disclosure basically is a, a, a form of a whistleblower law protection. <clears throat> and it's, again, it's my responsibility as part of this training and review to inform you of your rights. Uh, in this, in this, uh, this is not the order I'm going to send them to you in the email, but these are the links of interest that I do need you to review. In the email, they're going to be listed in order. So actually, this presentation should be the last thing you're listening to as you review the other things which are complement to this in order for you to complete uh, what I could call this refresher course to satisfy the OSHA rules, OSHA rules uh, of training and informing of our risk protocols. Um, thank you very much, as always, for your attention. I hope this has been helpful. And uh, as always, please do not hesitate to reach out with any questions or concerns. Thank you very much.